uh, from the top of the daf, and the discussion had been about um, using, the Mishnah had mentioned using the legs of a bed for schach, and assumed that those were mekabal um, and the Gemara got into a question, how are detached legs from a bed um, susceptible for tumah? They're not part of a, it's wood, and wood needs a receptacle, and it's not even part of a vessel now, it's a broken vessel. So it related to a debate where, uh, about, um, in a Mishnah, in Caitlin, about a broken bed, or a bed taken into part, not broken, because I can talk about a disassembled bed, um, and that there's an opinion that it actually, um, even in a disassembled state, or partially disassembled, assembled state could still become Tamei because it's going to be reassembled, as Tosos points out, and because it could somewhat be used in its current state, and that would be the case that we'd be talking about with half of the bed with two legs attached. So that's just explaining the Mishnah. Now, the Gemara, however, the Gemara suggested a very different explanation. The different explanation the Gemara suggested is not that now it can become Tamei, but since it once was a vessel, it remains considered for laws of Sukkah invalid Schach, meaning it's no longer able to become Tamei if it's a no if it's a broken vessel or a detached or you know no longer usable but uh, maybe it still remains in valid schach because of its history maybe that just can, you know labels it for life so that now is the issue the Gemara is going to turn to so let's take a look gufa let's go back to the original statement and look at it in greater uh, focus um Rabbi Ami Bar so this was so Rabbi Ami Bar said if you use worn out vessels or worn out clothing as Gemara will explain it psula it's still invalid even though these are no longer uh, um, able uh, susceptible for tum'ah because they're no longer wearable or usable they're no longer halachically considered a vessel nevertheless it was once a vessel and it was once a clothing and therefore it remains invalid my claim what do you mean by that what's the you know be a little more precise so it says amar baye matlaniyot like rags shein bem that are not even three fingers width by three fingers width. The lochazin lo lanim below lashirim. They're not fit either. Not only for for wealthy people you wouldn't use them. Even poor people wouldn't use them. What does this mean? What is the minimum size of a piece of cloth that's considered to be usable and therefore makabel tuma? So the gemara actually has three different measures. One is three tfachim by three tfachim, which is ba- which is like a foot by a foot, or a little bit less, let's say nine inches by nine inches. The other is three fingers by three fingers, which is about, I don't know, an inch and a half, two inches by two inches. Okay, and it says that the bigger size, if you're wealthy, anything less than three tfachim by three tfachim, you throw out. So for you, it stops being a vessel. But for a poor person, they're going to use a smaller size. What are they going to use it for? They're going to use it for patching. You know, they patch up their clothing. So, but so therefore, it's smaller than three trucking by three trucking. They'll still use what they won't use is something that's smaller than than three fingers by three fingers. That's already so small; it's not even usable for them. Again, this becomes very interesting. The uh, the uh, gendered language of the Hebrew, the gender nature of the Hebrew language, and the thankfully the fact that the some of the different measurements switch between Zohar and Akeva. So when the Gemara talks about these things, it will talk about Shalosh al Shalosh or Shlosh al Shlosh, which is very different. Shlosh al Shlosh is three Tfachim by three Tfachim, because Tefach is masculine, so it's Shlosh, the numberings are sort of reversed from the gender of the word. Shlosh al Shlosh is, means three Tfachim by three Tfachim. Here we're talking about a, sm- a very small piece, Shalosh al Shalosh, three fingers width by three fingers fingers with, and that is so small nobody would use it. So even though we're at a stage that you've got a piece of cloth that is so small nobody would use it, and therefore under no measure would it be considered a vessel, nevertheless it is still puzzle for schach because it once was considered a kli, once was considered clothing. Okay, so that's a very important halach for hilchos schach, that you can't even use broken vessels or things that once were, 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 were kalim. Um, so the Gemara now says, right, and you can imagine scenarios like that. Like I said, you you know, you're walking by the street and somebody's throwing out the garbage and there's a whole broken up table into pieces of wood. Oh, and it great, it's sukkahs tomorrow, you gather up some of the wood, right? So it yeah, actually is a problem based on this teaching. Okay, so the Gemara says like this. Tiny um, Gavasi to Ravami Bartivyumi. We taught similar to Ravami Bartivyumi. Machatzelos um, shel uh, shayfa. If you have a mat of shel um, gemi 
of uh, different types of um, um, of different types of like uh, of material. Um, I don't know how do they translate it. I didn't look it up, but one is like a is it sort of like a, 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 a weave or a uh, rushes rushes sedges and rushes. Oh, and now. Sedge of rushes. That's oh, no, sorry, sedge or rushes. Sedge or rushes. Okay, papyrus so papyrus and reed grass. Papyrus reeds, right? Some type of a reed, a wicker, a wicker uh, mat. Okay, what's the halacha? Um, um, uh, uh, so if you have sort of the remnant of it, so like it's a little leftover piece of mat, it broke up and you're left over with a little section of mat, even though it's smaller than the shear, meaning the normal shear here, not a shear for schach, but a shear for tuma. Okay, the normal size for tuma that you need, um, that you need for a mat to be considered a vessel and usable for tuma is six tvachim by six tvachim. Which is pretty big. It's like a foot and a half by a foot and a half. Okay, a mat smaller than that you don't use. So even though you've got this remnant of a mat and it's smaller than the size for being a vessel for tuma, and it's not fit for becoming tamei, ein misachim behem. You still cannot use it for schach. So basically, the exact same halacha about clothing applied now to a vessel to a mat. You have a mat, it started off the size of a big enough mat to become tamay. Now it's so small that it cannot. Nevertheless, you cannot use this piece of it because it originated from a vessel, <coughs> even though now it is no longer susceptible for tum'ah. Machatzal uh, Sakanim, now that we're talking about this, if you have a mat made out of like um, uh, sticks or uh, reeds, um, reeds I should say, Gidola Masachim Behem, if it's big, you can use it for schach. Katana ain't Masachim Behem, if it's small, you can't. Now that should strike you as ironic, because until now we've been talking about the larger the size, the more it's considered a vessel, the more it's considered to be able to become tamay. But this is actually a larger discussion we're going to have in a few days, which is, and this is extremely important, because now everybody uses these schach mats. You know, you roll up these schach mats, and the, well, is that a, is that makabal tumor or not? I mean, you could use one of those things. Before they started making them, you know, large scale for sukkah purposes, you could go into your Home Depot and get a similar type of a bam bamboo mat. Now, what would those be sold for? What would people use those bamboo mats for? So often they'd use it for sitting. Sometimes they might use it for a wall, like for a screen, but they might use it for sitting. So that's the question. If you have a mat, do we say that it's a kli, it's made for sitting, and therefore it's makabotuma? Or do we say it's made more for like putting on your roof, putting up on a wall, and therefore not a kli, and therefore not makabotuma? So the Gemara says it depends on the size. A small size, you know, sort of big enough for one human's tush or maybe two or three or whatever, you know, that's a mat. If it gets to be very large, people don't use it for a sitting mat. They use it for a wall. They use it for a roof. And therefore, it's not in a kabotuma, and therefore, it's kosher. So it's quite fascinating. The bigger it is, in this case, the more it defines it as a different type of a thing, not a vessel, but a piece of, uh, you know, structure, and therefore, not in a kabotuma, and therefore, acceptable. Okay, so that's the point. Gedola mesachim ba a big one. You can use it. Katana ain't mesachim ba small one. You cannot. Maybe Eliezer Omer afi mekabelas tuma ve mesachim ba even a big one. I disagree with you. It's usable as a mat for sitting on, and therefore it cannot become. It, you can. It's 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 fit for becoming tamei, and therefore it cannot be used as kosher schach. So more of that later. But the upshot for us is that um, once something started as a vessel, it remains invalid for schach, even though it is no longer a vessel. And now we go to the second part of the Mishnah, which is digging out a sukkah from a haystack, and you wind up with walls and with a um, with a roof made out of hay, so it should be okay. But the thing is, you never put the roof on. The roof got made sort of by itself, indirectly, when you removed the inside of the haystack. And that is the, the classic problem of ta'asev v'lomina asua. You have to make the sukkah that can somehow be pre-made, you know, made, you know, sort of indirectly, not through a direct act of being made. And again, sukkah here refers to the schach. So let's take a look. Amaravhuna, Lo Shanu, this is the, we only taught that this was a problem. Ella Sha'in Sham Khalal Tefah, that it did not begin with a space with a volume of a tefah, with a cavity of a tefah. The Meshach Shiva going the length of seven by seven tefachim, which is the minimum size of a, of a sukkah. Aval Yesham Chalal Tefach, the Meshach Shiva, if there starts with a cavity of a tefach going seven by seven, Hareze Sukkah, it is a sukkah. What does that mean? It means the mission is talking about your standard case. Your standard case is you've got a haystack, it's all hay, and you come along, right, and you're going to hollow out 
you know, your sukkah from it and take it out, and then you've made the schach indirectly by hollowing that out. Okay, but let's say it didn't, it, when it started, it didn't start as all hay. It was all hay here, but it started, and you had for some reason, it's hard to imagine exactly what the scenario is that you've created this, you know, how physically this happened. Maybe you put the hay on top of some type of a chest or something. Imagine you have Actually, a low line. Actually, picture here. It's on top of a platform. Okay, right. So you had some type of a platform, and you dumped your haystack on top of it. So here, in the sukkah, you've already started with a a cavity of seven of uh, that's actually should more look like a square but it looks mad seven by seven fachim and one half a high and then you put the haystack on top of it so now the question is when you initially put the haystack on top of it maybe you did the making of the schach because you put the schach you put the hay on top of a <coughs> cavity that's the size of a sukkah area it's like obran is only a height of one tefa. So is that making the schach, because now it's over an area of one tefach, and when you finish it, you're just fixing up the walls? Or do we say that doesn't yet count as schach? To be schach, it has to be higher than ten tefachim. It has to be over the height of a sukkah. And he is saying that that actually does count as schach. In wow. this case, if you have something that's this, and you put the schach on this type of an area, seven by seven by one, you made schach of a sukkah, because now a tefach of one, as we know, is considered an ohel, like a tent, like a roof, for purposes of tuma, so therefore it actually is making something that is considered schach, and the fact that it's not high enough, okay, that's a problem with the walls of a sukkah, it's a problem with the dimensions of the sukkah, but it's not a schach problem. You have kosher schach on a not high enough sukkah, okay? So let's take a look at that Gemara. Ava yesham chalal tefak b'neshach shiva, harei sukkah that is valid. Tanya mihochi we taught similarly, hachoti b'gadish l'asot lo sukkah, harei sukkah. We have a bright that teaches the opposite of our Mishnah, it says it's kosher. Harei sukkah. So the Gemara says, "Anan tanan ain't a sukkah." Our mission teaches it's no good. So rather than taking it to debate, and the lav shmamina, it must be here is the reconciliation. Kid Rav Huna, like Rav Huna, that the brighter that says it is good is talking about that it started with. It's so funny to leave out that tiny little detail, which is so bizarre. But okay, it's talking about a scenario where it started by one seven by seven by one high, and then it's kosher. You made an act of making kosher schach, and then you finish by digging out the rest of it. You obviously have to dig out the rest of it. You need ten tefachim by ten tefachim, but you started by an act of kosher. Um, Shmami no, that's a good proof. Some say that Rav Huna's statement didn't start as a commentary to the Mishnah. It started by dealing with the contradiction. What was the contradiction? Tanat, our Mishnah says, Hachotim pigdish lasos lo sukkah in a sukkah. If you dig out, it's not a sukkah. The Hatanya harays a sukkah. We have a bright that says it is. I'm Rav Huna, so comes Rav Huna to say, I got the answer. Lo kasha, it's not difficult. Kan b'shi'eshem chalal tefach. If you started with a hollow of a tefach, b'meshach shiva by seven by seven, then you made a kosher schach, and then just dig out the rest to make it ten by ten, to make it ten high. Kan b'shi'eshem chalal b'meshach shiva. The Mishnah is talking about there was no hollow to begin with, and therefore your act of digging out was an act of creating schach, but it was indirect, and therefore it's tasev v'lo mina asuei. There's a very nice little toast for that does a, you know, sometimes a thing that uh, Achronim like to do is say, Lishitoso, like, like, oh, often they say it by the Rishonim. They say, you know, this Rishon, you know, who says this in this Gemara is, far, is going to, co- takes the same approach in another Gemara, and you see how these ideas are all connected, which is, okay, that makes sense. People should have consistent ideas across and across different areas, but it's fun to see where ideas, like, connect, and they're consistent applications of the same idea. Here, Tosus does that, by a, an opinion of an Amora. If you take a look at Tosvos, he says, Avayesham Chalal Tefach, four lines down in the wide lines, he says, Matzina Lameymar, Rav Huna Lataime. We could say that Rav Huna, who says it's kosher schach when it's over an area of one tefach high, is going to based according to the reason he said earlier. Damar Lael, he said like about six days ago, Gabe Bein Sukkah, Bein Sukkah Sukkah Tefach. Remember, we had the halach question of a sukkah on top of a sukkah, two schachs. And the question was, how high does it separate, does the second schach have to be from the first, so it can get that identity of an independent schach and be defined as a schach? And guess what? Rav Huna said, once it's a tefach higher, it's already defined as schach, and therefore it's the problem of sukkah under a sukkah. So says, look at that. Rav Huna is consistent. He says that once it's a tefach high, it already has the identity of schach. Not necessarily the sukkah is kosher yet, but it has an identity of schach. 
Okay? And then he says, Vishemaman Damar Hasam Arba Hachamoda Talishmu Damar Hasam Asara Hacham Lo Shaya. So it says uh, points out that it's not, you know, you could be more machmir there than you are here. Meaning let's say Shmuel. So there says ten fachim. But Shmuel says, why do you need ten fachim? Because Shmuel says it's not enough to say schach under a schach. You have to say sukkah under a sukkah. So so Tos says, okay, you know, Shmuel in theory could agree here. Because here, there it's an idea of sukkah, you need ten tzvachim. Here it's an idea of schach, maybe you would agree. So it's interesting connecting those two debates, and then he deals with the four tzvachim, which is more complicated. But the interesting point is, the same Rav Huna who there said it gets an identity of schach when it's one tzvach removed, here too says it gets that identity, you made a kosher schach, and now you just have to finish the walls. Okay, this, by the way, gets to this question that was asked the other day about Tasev Alomina Asurai, about when you put, let's say you put kosher, your schach on top of your sukkah frame before making the walls, right? Is that Tasev Alomina Asurai? You made it before the walls were, before the walls were up. Um, so that actually is debated in the Akronim, but this Gemara makes it sound very clear that it should be okay, because this Gemara is almost the same in reality. You had kosher schach, and the way it's being framed is that the walls weren't high enough, the walls weren't ten tefachim, they were one tefach walls. You finish making them into ten tefach walls, and it's fine. Once you put up, the, once the, right, so the schach could be put up before you had the full walls. That's certainly what this Gemara seems to be saying, so that should make it okay. You might want to make a distinction. At least here you have the beginning of a wall, you have a one tefach wall, as opposed to the frame, you don't have a beginning of a wall at all. But anyway, it is a interesting question about, you know, do you, when you put up the schach, do the walls have to be kosher? This Gemara certainly says, even if the walls are just one tefach, you can finish the walls afterwards. Yes? Schach has to shade most of the sun. In this case, we're not going to be shading all of the sun. Right, so we discussed that. What defines the schach to be so thick and permanent that it's no longer schach? So Tos has basically said, it is not the fact that it lets in sunlight, it's based on another Gemara's fact that it lets in rain. Yeah. So yeah. I would think a haystack would let in rain. Yeah. Um, okay, so, <laughs> yes? Uh, actually, we should take that to raising the stuff, though, if we can get to it, the same way that you say. So you are, right, right. So, you're, so you're correct, because in this case, right, What's going to wind up being the schach at the end is going to be this space over here. This stuff here isn't going to be the schach. But in a way, you could say, fine, but when you put this whole, you know, this whole mound of hay over it, all of this was schach. It was very thick schach. So even though you're removing the bottom part of schach, all of this was schach over the one tefach area. And you're still keeping the top part, and that was also initially schach. Right? When we say you have a tefach area and you put this on, we're saying all of it, not just the bottom layer stuff, all of this is kosher stuff, and then you remove the middle section. But right, but that would be okay. Rashi compares it, by the way, to the case where, you might remember before in the Gemara, you had a nine tefach sukkah, and then what you did was you did was you dug a hole here in the floor, right, and made a ten tefachim. Mm -hmm. So there too he says, look, you, you start, the schach can be kosher, and the walls finished later. Right? So that's what happened here, too. The schach was kosher, and then the height was finished later, which means they became walls, halachically, after the schach was put on. You don't have to do that, uh, ritual of raising it. Oh, oh, raising and putting down? Yeah. Correct, because it was put up kosher when it was put up. No, that's the whole point. Right. If, you did, if, you, if you built the circle, you built the and with, before the wall. And, and then you put the walls. According to this, it would seem that the most uh, direct application of this to a case of putting it on the schach first and then the frames is you would not have to lift up the schach again. Okay, you might want to make a distinction if it started with a tefach wall as opposed to starting with no wall. But the simple application of this is, is that you can have, the, you can do the making of the schach before there's any wall, before there's a wall. Okay, so let's take a look now at, but, you know, I would first put up your walls before your schach, okay? <laughs> Don't get into a machlokas, all right? But that's, anyway, but that's what this Gemara seems to be concluding. Let's take a look now at the next Mishnah. Hamishal said the fun is talking about walls. If you are lowering down your walls, right, imagine you basically have like a curtain that you hang up near the top of the skach and you lower it down, okay, so that's just uh, Michelle shows word for lowering down, you're, but you're, you start at the top and you lower your walls down towards the floor, yeah, the walls down. So this is an idea we know, we've heard of. If it is more than three tefachim removed from the floor, it is invalid. Why? Because you cannot say lavud, lo, within three tefachim it's like it's connected. Three tefachim or more, I shouldn't say more than three tefachim, three tefachim or more, it's no longer considered attached to the ground and you need your wall to be attached 
to the ground. Okay, it's interesting, by the way, that it seems to be just a straight application of the Lovud principle, but there are places where the Gemara specifically also refers to its inability to function as a mechitza, because it says three trachim or more, kid goats can go underneath it. Um, and that's interesting, that it also sort of just makes it a, a specific mechitza idea, and not just a general Lovud idea, like if you can't even stop animals from running under it, you can't call it a wall. Okay, but more simply, it's a simple application it's of the Lovud idea. Right, right, exactly. Use the same discussions in Ervin. Okay, so that so it has to be attached to the ground. It has to be within three trachim of the ground. Now, milmata lamatla. Let's say you're building your wall from the floor up, and it's it also has to reach the schach. In gavoa sar tefachim ke. Once it's ten tefachim high, it's kosher. It doesn't have to touch the schach. Why not? Even though it does, in principle, have to touch the schach. Or this is that's the normal way it's understood. And in principle, it has to touch the schach. You got here. Okay, this is a very common case in the Gemara. Okay, you've got here your schach, your schach is up here, but your walls are only, you know, are only, you know, only at the bottom, right? Right? Is it kosher or not? Because Mara said, once these are 10 trough and it's kosher. Okay, you got your sort of scenario. That's not a sukkah, that's a sukkah. That's supposed to be just pulled, so there. Okay, so why is it kosher? So you could say, because you could in theory say, the walls don't have to reach the schach. You have kosher schach, you have kosher walls, they're under the schach, right? So it's not like they're not under the schach. Maybe that's enough. Maybe it's under the schach is good enough. It's, a, it's If it's higher than three tfachim, it can't be called a mechitza because things can get through it. Once it's connect, connected to the ground, and it's within three tfachim, and it can, or it's within three tfachim, and it can be called a mechitza, <coughs> and you have a kosher mechitza, under the schach, it's okay. That's normally what you would have said, or I don't know, you might have said that. The Gemara, though, you might remember, has the idea of the, what I've called, or well, the Gemara calls it, good achis, and good asik, just to remind you, these are the classic, what I call the magic principles in sukkah, and dofen akuma. So dofen akuma, you remember, I call the magic bending wall. When you have tussle schach, you look at your schach as a continuation of your wall. These are the magic extending walls. Okay, so good achis, by the way, it's interesting what the word good means. Rahi says the word good means to stretch, um, but also good <coughs> also sometimes means a wall. Okay, ah. so anyway, so good achis, but then the next phrase is good achis mechitzta. So anyway, so it means stretch your wall down or good, take your, or have your wall go down or good achis, your wall stretches up. So this is the magic, right, you know, you know extending wall down. <laughs> And this is the same one, the magic extending wall up. So once you say you have a, a mechitza, then you can say good osik, and we envision the mechitza going all the way up. And that's why it doesn't have to touch the schach. Not that in principle it doesn't have to touch, which would have been one way of saying it. In principle it has to right, be adjacent to the schach. The only problem is, the, only, the way you do it is by saying you imagine the wall going up. Now, uh, the uh, astute person will say, one minute. If you can imagine the wall, once you have ten tefachim going up, and it doesn't have to be close to the schach, go ahead, what are you going to say? Right, what was the problem in the beginning of the Mishnah? Let it be less than, let it be more than three tefachim. You've got a ten tefach wall, let it extend down. Well, guess who says that? The next opinion. Rabbi Yossi Omer, Kishem Milamata Lamala Asar Tfachim, the same way ten Tfachim is enough from the ground and it doesn't have to reach the schach, Kach Milamala Mata Asar Tfachim. Once you get ten Tfachim going down, right, you have Melchitza and then imagine it continuing to extend down. The rabbis disagree. The rabbis say it doesn't start to be called the Melchitza unless it is the basic idea of a Melchitza is a wall at the ground level. That's the basic concept of a mechitza, not a suspended wall in midair. So it only gets an identity of a mechitza once it's connected to the ground. Once it's a mechitza, then it can extend up. Reb Yossi disagrees. Reb Yossi says any tent fachim of some horizontal plane is a mechitza, and therefore even if it is high, it can go you know, down, it can go down to the, it, it, it can be high off the ground. Interesting question according to Reb Yossi, and we'll get to this, is like, can you do this twice? Right, let's say, according to Reb Yossi, you had your wall like this. <laughs> Could you extend it both up and down? But anyway, he allows you to go down as well as up. The rabbis say, no, there's a difference. It has to start by being connected to the ground. Okay, so let's take a look at the Gemara. B'may k'miflugi, what's the debate about? Mar savar mechitza tluya materes. One holds that a suspended mechitza makes the space allowable. Umar sever mechitza tluya ain't a materis. It does not make it allowable. Now, the word materis is a strange word, right? 
you would have said it's a machitza, you would have said maybe it's machshir, makes it a good sukkah. What's the word materet? So the point is, this is a debate that is borrowed, or an ish, uh, a language that is borrowed from Hilchos Shabbos. Because the other ma- one of the other major places <coughs> that machitza matters is in, in, you know, the Gemara is in Hilchos Shabbos. A space that's, you know, has machitza ten tefachim high, is a rishus, you know, three more, three and four, or however many, and it's a rishus hayachim. Right? So that is, so what, let's say, you have a suspended mechitza, high off the ground. Can you carry in the space below? Is the space below Rishus HaYachid or not? So there is a debate of mechitza tluya materet. The word materet comes from that discussion. Will it make the space within the mechitzas permissible, meaning a private domain for Shabbos? But it, it, the Gemara is assuming at the end of the day it's the same debate. Does it count as a mechitza or not? If it counts as a mechitza for Shabbos, it should count for sukkah, vice versa. The Gemara will question that in a minute, but now we are assuming that it's the same question here would be the question by Shabbos. Is a mechitza matluya materet? Does it make the space permissible? And now we're going to see that debate. Tanan Hassam, we taught over there in Ervin. Bor Shabing Shtei Chatzerot, Ein Mimalin Mimene B'Shabbat. Elin Kain Asala Mechitza Asarat Tvachim. If you have a well between two courtyards, and each courtyard has made a separate Eruv, and you cannot carry from one courtyard to the next, um, so if, and but but what? Unfortunately, that's okay. Fine, don't care from one courtyard to the next. But you got a well that's on the borderline between the two courtyards, and it's in the space of both of the courtyards. And so, don't fill your water from it on Shabbat, because even though the wells are Rishut Hayachid, right? What's the scenario? The scenario is here's courtyard one, right? Here's all the houses, right? You didn't know you have to take drawing 101 for the, uh, <laughs> to, to give the dafyon. Here's courtyard number two, okay? Right, and here it has, I should have drawn it in a different color. Anyway, okay, fine, whatever. And right here, and they have walls around them, right? So there's walls that make it a Rishus HaYachid, all right? But right here in the, um, in the space between courtyard one and two is a well. Circular, so it's more like a well. And don't go ahead and draw water from it on Shabbos. Because why? Because you'll be taking stuff from the other courtyard. Right? You're not allowed to carry from one courtyard to the next because there's no Eruv between the two. Each one made their own Eruv. Each one is a Rishut Hayachid. They're separate Rishut Hayachids. You can't carry from a Rishut Hayachid that is not part of your Eruv into, into one that is. So if you draw water, the water at the bottom is part in their courtyard, part in yours. And it's always moving around. So you're going to be taking stuff from their courtyard into yours on Shabbos. You can't draw water from it on Shabbat. Okay, that's what it says. Elaim came, but here's the way you can do it. Unless what you did was Asala Machitza Sarat Fahim Bain Milmala Bain Milmata, unless you made a machitza uh, in the well, whether high up or below, Bain Batoch Ogno, whether right underneath the um the the um the lip. Which means what? We'll do a different view of it. Okay. We'll view a let's see how I'm gonna just show this. Okay. Here's your well, looks like a bucket. Okay, anything like that. <laughs> okay, here's the well. Here's the water. Okay, and this that's the dividing line between the courtyard. Like that's one courtyard. This is courtyard A, this is courtyard B. Okay, people get the picture? Mm-hmm. Now, there's a wall, and naturally there's a wall between the courtyards. So naturally there's a wall that goes like this, and the wall actually goes over the well. Okay, so you, that's the scenario. So it says that's not good enough that there's a wall over the well. Mm-hmm. If you want to draw water from this on Shabbat, you have to make actually a wall hanging in the well itself. Whether it's below, right next to the water, whether it's above, right under the lip, the wall has to be in the well itself then we'll view it as though the wall goes down and separates the water, but otherwise the wall up here doesn't work. Now, you will say, what is the difference? The wall is still not at the bottom of the well, it's not in the water. Either way, whether it's here or here, you're still saying that we envision it as though it goes all the way down. Okay, so what difference does it make? Why not use the, the wall on top? So the answer is because the Chazal, look, water, we take water totally for granted, but anybody that's ever following things that are happening in developing countries, you know, still knows, that, you know, in, in Israel that's too, right. of course. But I mean, I, I don't just mean the rainfall water. I mean just the ability to get water to where you are, right? We take that, you know, indoor plumbing completely for granted. You know, and, and, you know obviously in the time of Chazal, it was a major thing to have access to water. So what they said was, on Shabbat, 
So they make particular leniencies to allow <coughs> you to, ac to access water on Shabbat. So one, one ca classic example is you've got a uh, body of water below your, uh, you know, your, you, have a, you have your house, you know, whatever, right on or an apartment building. Or well, you're on a ship, it's also. Anyway, it's right by the water. You have a body of water below. Okay, how do you draw water from it? That's a Carmelist, you're in a Rishus HaYachid. What you do is you have your balcony and you make a little Rishus HaYachid, you know, sort of box on your balcony. And we envision it as though it goes all the way down into the water and becomes a Rishus HaYachid in the water so you can lower your bucket through this box and draw the water. Okay, so those are special leniencies we do to envision a walls going down and creating a Rishus HaYachid in the water to allow you to have access to the water. And the, 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 the phrase for this is Kalhu, that's not El being from, Kalhu Shehikilu Chachamim Pemayim. Okay, they allow the, you to view, view walls going down and be lenient in order to give you access to water. So, we will say that by, I should use, have used a different color, we will say that if you make a wall specifically for the purpose of the water. If you go ahead and make a wall for access to water, right, then we'll say, oh, we'll be lenient, we'll view it as though the wall, walls go all the way down and therefore to give you access to water. But this wall is not made for access to water. And therefore, we're not going to apply that lenient principle up here, even though we will apply it over here. Okay? Is that, is that clear? So that's why the Mishnah says you can do it if the wall is within the well, like we let you do it by making a little, you know, hut out on your balcony. Um, if you're specifically for the purpose of getting access to the water, we'll give you that lenient. I should have bought the picture book for Yerubim for this. Exactly. Okay. So, Rabbi Shimon Gamliel Rabbi Gamliel says, no, he says, this is a debate of Beit Shammai, Beit Hillel. Beit Shammai only milmala. Beit Shammai says you can have the wall even high up, but meaning not above the well, but in the well near the lip. Beit Hillel only milmata. You can only have the well, water, the wall right near the water. It's not good if it's higher up. So that would make Beit Hillel the machmir. And that's a little strange because this isn't listed in one of the things where Beit Hillel is machmir. So if you look at Tosvos, he says, Beit Shammai only milmala, Beit Hillel only milmata, so in Ervin, in all of the manuscripts that Tosos had, the gears was the opposite. That Beit Shammai was the Machmir and said the wall had to be by the water, by the by the by the water, and Beit Hilla was the Makil and said the wall could even be higher up in the well. Okay, so he says it's a debate of Beit Shammai and Beit Hilla, whether it can be low, whether it can be high up in the well. Amar Rav Yehuda. Now Rav Yehuda is the interesting position for us. This wall, why is this wall having better powers than this big wall up here? If it works for the wall in here, it should work for the wall up here. So meaning, what is Rebbe Yehuda saying? Rebbe Yehuda is saying, I don't need a special leniency by water. I think, says Rebbe Yehuda, you can use this wall to envision it going all the way down. Which means for Rebbe Yehuda, there's a general principle that a wall can extend down. Do people see that? That was the purpose of all of this. Because whatever you say in here, that's a special water in halacha. Okay, but Reb Yehuda says even the wall up here works, which means Reb Yehuda thinks a general principle is a wall that's suspended over your ground floor, because this is the relevant ground floor here, the bottom of the well, that a, a wall that is suspended can go all the way down, even as a general special halacha, without being made particularly as a leniency for water. Okay, and therefore that seems to correspond to what's going on in our Mishnah, the debate of a suspended wall. So let's take a look. Amar Rabba, so it says, look, this is the debate. The same way Rebbe, Rebbe Yehuda says over there, by Shabbos, a suspended wall works as a general principle. That's Rebbe Yossi, who says a suspended wall works by Sukkah. So that's the debate. It's the, sa it's the same position. So Amar Rabba, Bar Barachan, Amar Rebbe Yochanan. So Rabba Barachan says the name of Rebbe Yochanan. Rebbe Yehuda, Bashitas Rebbe Yossi, Amra. Rebbe, I'm sorry, Rebbe Yehuda, Bashitas Rebbe Yossi, Amra. Look, the Rebbe Yehuda uh, in the discussion in Erevin is Rebbe Yossi in our Mishnah. Damar Mechitza Tliya Materes, that a suspended Mechitza works. So that's, you know, again, Materes is more of an Erevin Shabbos word, but that's Rabbi Yossi's position, that's Rabbi Yehuda's position, it's the same position. The Gemara says, the Lohi. The says, no, not necessarily. 
They're not necessarily, you might say it works for Shabbos and not for Sukkah, it works for Sukkah and not for Shabbos. What's the, why would that be? Lo Rabbi Yehuda suffer like Rabbi Yossi. Rabbi Yehuda might not hold like Rabbi Yossi. It could work for Shabbos without working for Sukkah. But Lo Rabbi Yossi suffer like Rabbi Yehuda. And Rabbi Yossi wouldn't necessarily hold like Rabbi Yehuda. It could work for Sukkah without working for Shabbos. What's the logic behind that? Lo Rabbi Yehuda suffer like Rabbi Yossi. He wouldn't hold like Rabbi Yossi that it would work for Sukkah. Atkan lo kamer Reb Yehuda hasam ela be'iruve chatzeres drabana. Reb is only willing to say that for an eruv chatzeres purposes, right? It's not like it was a biblical question. Both of them were rishus hayachids. Without this, it was only a question of allowing you to draw water from the well. It was only a rabbinic problem of taking, uh, you know, an object from one rishus hayachid to another rishus hayachid. So fine for rabbinic purposes, he'll let the he'll say a suspended wall will work. Avol hacha. Sukkah de Arisa, but here that you're dealing with a biblical question of Sukkah, lo, he wouldn't allow this. He'll allow a suspended wall for rabbinic issues, not for biblical ones. That's why he wouldn't necessarily agree by Sukkah. The low Reb Yossi several like Reb Yudah, and Reb Yossi won't necessarily hold like Reb Yudah. I can look on Reb Yossi, ha ha, Reb Yossi only says it works by Sukkah, why? Ela besukkah, de mitzvah say. Because at the end of the day, the worst Avera you could do in terms of Hilcho Sukkos is not be Mekayim Yorasei's. Right? You could do everything wrong, and at the end of the day, I'm not talking about the Yuntav of Sukkos, you know, but the sort of mitzvah, Sukkah and Lulav, is you wouldn't have done your mitzvah Sasei. As opposed to Shabbos. Shabbos, it's a world full of big Averas. Okay? So, <laughs> so it says, Avo Shabbos to Suskilo, lo. Shabbos, where there's a lot of acts punishable by death, it's big averas by Shabbos, even though this is a rabbinic application, we can be very strict in the laws of Shabbos. So, in the end of the day, the Gemara does not have, you know, what I think could have been a more interesting conceptual difference between Shabbos and Sukkah, right? If you wanted to say there's a difference between Shabbos and Sukkah, you might want to say, well, by Sukkah, it's not just being about a machitza, it's about being a wall. Maybe there's a different status about being of a wall than a Sukkah. If you want your Sukkah to be considered a habitable space, maybe it has to go all the way to the ground to be considered habitable. You could have made a conceptual distinction between the two. The Gemara just says the distinctions just could be how stringent or lean lenient it is. So my, we, we might consider the Shabbos case more lenient and allow it there because it's only a Durabanan. We might consider the Sukkah case more lenient because it's a world of only a mitzvah saseh and not a world of Isser Skila. So you could paskin in one case, not the other, because of stringency leniency. But again, it would have been interesting to explore that maybe it's different because maybe the criteria are fundamentally different, particularly the idea that Sukkah to be, is, the Mechit has to be more functionable, functional in order to make it a habitable space that might might have more demanded that you don't just use a suspended mechitza. Okay, so now the Gemara continues. Um, One minute. We're going to tell you about a story about, uh, uh, th uh, there's a famous story that happened in Tzipori, which you'll find about in a minute. Now Tzipori, as we all know, I'm, I'm teasing, is Reb Yossi's town. Okay, Reb Yossi was the goddle of Tzipori. So, and we're going to have a story on Shabbos where they, a sink happened in Tzipari and they used a suspended mechitza to let them carry. Okay, now the Gemara assumes this is good evidence that Rabbi Yossi about Sukkah would apply his law by Shabbos. Because the Rabbi Yossi in our Mishnah says a suspended wall works by Sukkah. And there's this famous story in Tzipori that they used a suspended wall to carry on Shabbos. So you see, Rabbi Yossi does use his principle of Sukkah to apply it to Shabbos. So, Apimina said, no. On whose authority was that done? Lo alpi Reb Yossi. That was not done on Reb Yossi's authority. Ella alpi Reb Yishmael bi Reb Yossi. It was his son whose authority was. Reb Yossi had already passed away, and his son was the one who gave the ruling in Sipori. So you cannot prove that Reb Yossi would have applied the same principle in both cases. Maybe his son applied the principle in both cases, but Reb Yossi, we only know, applies it in Sukkah, maybe not by Shabbos. Now we're going to see the story of Sipori, which is a very fun story. Umam Maisa did Sipori. Umam Maisa, what was the story? Right? When Rav Dimi came from Eretz Yisrael, Amar, he said, One day they forgot, and they did not bring the Sefer Torah from before Shabbos into the house in the courtyard that they were going to use as a show. And that's a big problem, because how are you going to get the Sefer Torah to where it has to go? Okay, now, the issue again is, by the way, not the way Rashi explains it, it's not a Doraisa problem, but it's a Rabbana problem. It was just a yucky problem. He says, imagine you've got the following scenario, right? You've got your maboy, which is your basically your street, okay? And off of your maboy comes various courtyards, and each courtyard has houses, okay? And basically what you had here was, 
was that the Sefer Torah was in this house, and the Beit Knesset was over here, the other side of the Mabwe. Now, normally, right, if the Mabwe had was a dead end Mabwe and whatever, normally, you know, you could carry if it's a Rosh Hashanah, except if you want to carry into the Mabwe. You have to make a sheet of mavaot. You need rabbinically everybody to come together, shared loaf of bread. <coughs> Same idea as carrying in the courtyard. Okay, you didn't do it. So what are they going to do? Right? You can't make a sheet of mavaot on Shabbos. So you could say yeah, everybody should go over there to daven. But okay, maybe it was too small. So anyway, what they did was they put up curtains from one house to the next. Now, how does that work? It's already a rishus Well, how did that help? It helped because the reason a mavoi is no good is because it has multiple houses opening into it and it becomes like a public space until you do that shituf. If you put up these walls, the only houses are the, the one that has the show on the Beit Knesset. There are no other houses that enter into that space. So it's not a public type of a space that needs a shituf. And so that's how the walls now allow them to carry the Sefer Torah from one space to the next. Okay. Isn't that creating a, uh, an air of unchallenged? Right, right. Meaning, how are you really allowed to create a Rishus Yachid and to put up yeah. So the Gemara will ask that question. Okay. Let's take <laughs> let's let's take a look. But but that's what you went ahead and did. So um, so Lamacha the next day pierces Sadinim al Gabe Hamudim. They spread out uh, um, you know cloths on the on posts. Apparently they had posts. Um, the Hevi Sefer Torah and they brought the Sefer Torah for Karibo and they read from it. So the Gemara says, okay, so that was the story. So the first Chiddush is, for some reason, the Gemara assumes that these sheets are, are suspended off the ground more than three tfachim, right? Because that's how it, why it brought it into the discussion. Why it assumes that, who knows? I mean, maybe they just knew the story, and the story was, was that they were suspended high. So the re relevance of this, remember, is that, ah, you see this case, those things were suspended, they allowed you to carry, that's the position that a suspended mechitza works. It's Rebiosi by Sukkah applied to the Shabbos case. Okay, so that was the relevance. But now the Gemara is going to say, fine, put the mechitza tuya issue aside. Let's see how they really managed to do this. So the Gemara says like this. Pierce um, uh, did they literally? How can you say they spread the the, the curtains? Uh, the curtains. Where would they bring them from? Ella, right? Meaning, how did they get the curtains there to begin with? You can't carry in that space. So how did they get the curtains to start? So the Gemara says, Ella, rather you have to say. Um, they found that there had, that there was actually these things spread on a curtain, and that for the, and therefore they carried it, which is a little bit funny because they found a, a, a perfect thing exactly the way they needed it. But maybe it means that they moved it, like maybe they found the stuff, but also moving it. How do you move it if you don't have a ritual sayachin and so if you don't have? So it's a little bit funny now that we sort of have set, described like, oh, they discovered it all set up. Now, Excuse me, we're going to the discussion that we're having here about, because earlier the opinion was that the wall that was there, you didn't need to extend down, because on Shabbat you could intellectually right. extend it down, right? right? So this could be like they didn't have kavana to create a mechitza. Somebody hung up their laundry, uh, right? And then they said, you know, right, so, but right, but it so raises it the question. Well, Shabbat I'm going to get to that, that issue about, about kavana in a minute, but I want to so, but, but um, but yes, I'll get back to that in a minute. But I want to say first another thing about what the Gemara's question was. Rashi says the Gemara's question was, how do they get the cloths there? So it says, that's not a problem. You're creative. You don't have mechitza. How would you get um, um, you know, some, some type of a cloth from one place to another? Or let's say, what could you use that you could get to, from one place to another? Um, your, yes, yeah, the, the post, the top post would be my comfortor. No, no, no. Your clothes. Ah. How do you just wear some big shawl? walk over there and then take the shawl off and spread it. It's not a problem how they got it there. So it says the problem is, as was as was saying, and there's actually a girsa that says, how are you allowed to do this? You're making an OL on Shabbos. Yeah. Now you're not making an OL in the sense of a roof, right? That's I've been our focus of OL. But you're making part of a building, you're making the walls of a building. So that was the question. Not how did they get the curtains there. How they spread the curtains, right? That was your question, right? How they spread the curtains and make a halachic wall and make a wall on shop. Okay, fine, they found curtains already spread. Okay, which is a little bit, again, you know, hard to understand. You know, oh, they discovered exactly things spread the way they needed. Maybe it's like your point. Somebody had laid out their laundry and they said, hey, wait a minute. We can, oh, that's what you're saying. We can use this 
laundry line here, and this, you know, you, you wind up doing that on Shabbos, right? Wait, we got this fence, we got a bush over there, we got it. Okay, it works. So, so maybe that that's a good explanation of what it means. They found, they figured out that they could use that, and that also laundry would be a good example of mechitzah tluya. Right. You have to have like big uh, cloaks or whatever, you know, on your laundry. Okay, so that's the explanation. That, by the way, is a very important question of are you allowed to make a mechitza on Shabbos? Because Rashi says, he, Rashi crossed out the girsa that said, how are you allowed to make a, to make a, a oil on Shabbos? He says, of course you can. It's a mechitza. Mechitza isn't an oil, and oil needs a roof. Rashi crossed out that girsa. According to Rashi, you can make walls on Shabbos. Okay, not with mortar and, you know, a brick, but whatever. You can hang things up. Tosa says, no, it's a problem. But Tosa acknowledges that there are other Gemaras that sound like it is okay to make a wall on Shabbos. What's the difference? And Tosa introduces a very important principle in the of Shabbos that you cannot make, it's not that you can't make any wall. You could, like, suspend uh, something for, I don't know, you know, you have a nice, uh, um, you know, a nice tapestry, and you want to, like, you know, suspend it on a line and look at it or whatever, you know, you want to even use it as, you want to create a private space. You're, you want to change in an area, so you spread out these cloths so it's like a private space, so you can change. You know, you can change privacy, all that. That's fine to make walls on Shabbos. What you can't do is you can't make a wall that halachically is, is, serves the halachic purposes of a wall. You can't make something a mechitza hamateret, a mechitza that makes the space permissible. That's more of an effective status change of what that wall is doing, and that's what's not allowed. So here, because the mechitza made the space permissible, that's the type of wall you're not allowed to you're not allowed to make. I'll just read you the one sentence in Tosfos that says that. He says like this. He says. Um, if you take a look, four lines in Tosos or five lines before the lines get to be the medium size, the word line starts with the word Lirabenu Tam. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. So he says, mm -hmm. a wall can also be an ohel. A problem. When the mechitza serves a function of making the space permissible in a halachic way, and that's why it was made, not just it happens to do that, then that is the problem. So you can't make a wall to serve a halachic function. You can make a wall to serve another function on Shabbos. That's actually how we pass him. Yes. And yet I've seen people putting up mechitzas in Shabbos in order to daven. Right. So that is that works because we say that the function of a mechitza for davening is more functional. It's like the privacy scenario I gave you before. So it allows you to daven, but it doesn't halachically create that idea of a of a of a different type of a space. Okay, the problem is when the wall is there to halachically make a status change in terms of the, the nature of the space. Whereas that, that type of a mechitza for davening, the way it's allowed on Shabbos, is that we emphasize it's basically there just to create privacy. Okay, the reality of creating privacy is it does allow you to daven, but that's its function, and it's not function is halachically to serve. If it was halachically to serve as a mechitza, you would only need ten tefachim, and you wouldn't need it to go higher. So it's actually interesting. People that are, there are some people that use a ten tefach mechitza, there are some shuls that still do. A few OU shuls still use ten of mechitza, and that would be. So if you only use a ten of mechitza, you can't make it on Shabbos because <laughs> because then you're applying to the normal laws of mechitza, and that is actually a problem. Yes. Yeah, Rabbi Noam Sachs told me that he heard personally from Rav Soloveitchik that mechitza had to be ten from high, and I saw Rabbi you heard of Rav Soloveitchik. Publicly, yes, say that yes. Rev. Hankin says Rev. Hankin says ten tefachim is really sufficient. But he also yes. says he also says it can't be it can't be a fabric of pizza. Well, it can't be suspended off the ground. Yeah, he, it's it's exactly this issue. If yeah. you want to make the mechitza for davening into a classic halachic mechitza, it has leniencies and stringencies. Yeah. Right. Okay. So let's keep on, let's continue. The Gemara says like this. Um, okay. Oh, by the way, one other final interesting side point I should make is I was doing some reading on um, ancient synagogues. I mean, if you have the patience for it, there's this great book that has everything. It's called it's called ancient. The, is it called the synagogue or something or ancient synagogue? It's like 800 pages thick. It's by Lee Levine. It has not Lee Levine. Lee Levine <coughs> might be by oh, I think Lee Levine. Anyway, it has absolutely everything about ancient synagogues. Anyway, so it's interesting that the older synagogues there was no place for the Sefer Torah. Old, you know, only sort of like I don't know how old, third century, fourth century did they start being an Aron in a place for Sefer Torah. So it's actually and some of the interesting literary. Ev I mean, that's clear from the architectural evidence, although I might have the centuries off. But some of the literary evidence to that is a story like this: they didn't bring the Sefer Torah from Erev Shabbos. Which means that they naturally kept the Sefer Torah in a different space than the Shul. 
and he, we don't find any evidence of aronot in the shuls, <laughs> except for you know, except in sort of later period, later maybe Tanaitic period, not super late, but you know, it, not in an earlier period. Okay, so the Gemara says like this: Amar of Chizda, Amar Avimi, Machatzeles. Or ba'al mashu materes besukah mishum dofen. So remember, I just told you before about the question about going both ways. He is going to have it go both ways, but with lavud, not with extending, because we don't pass one like Rabbi Yossi. We say you cannot do a suspended wall. But if you have a a, a mat that is four tefachim wide, four and a little bit, you can be. That's good for your sukkah. Here's your exact ten tefach sukkah, and what you're going to do is you're going to make a mat. That is four and a half, go right over here, right in the middle. So between it's not going to scale. So between that and the ground is right is two point nine trochim, and that to the top is two point nine, right? So combined, you do the math, right? So it's three, three, whatever, six, right? And the extra half covers up the point one, and therefore you've got your whole tent trochim. So you basically do a lovewood to the bottom and a lovewood to the top. Okay, maybe we have to do it more like that. Right, and therefore you can do the whole sukkah with a with a map that is four tefachim wide, okay, or a little more than four tefachim because love it is a little less than three. Machatzelas arbo mashu four and a little bit. Where am I? Materes besukkah mishum dofen as a wall. Hey, how do you do it? Talile beemsa. You put it smack in the middle of the wall, assuming an exact ten tefach sukkah. Pachos mishlosha lamata. Pachos mishlosha lamala. Within a little less than three tefachim off of the ground, and a little less than three tefachim off of the schach. Because pachos mishalosha kalavat. I mean, you get to say love it in both ways, and you have your wall. It says pshita. Isn't that obvious? Mal detein machad love it. I mean, and trade love it. Lo amina. And I might say you can say one love it. You can't do it at both ends. Kanash malan that you're able to do both. We will see later how often you can how much you can use multiple ones on top of one another, but here anyway, they're at opposite ends, and therefore it works. Meisve, um, I'll ask you on this. Machatzels shiva umashu materes besuka mishum dofen. We have a brighter that says you need it to be seven and a bit. Presumably, you can only use one lavud. You can't use two lavuds. No, it says no. Kitanyahi besuka gedola. That's talking about a big sukkah. Umai kamash mulan. What's it teaching us? Like Rebiosi. Meaning, when would you need a mat seven? You would need a mat seven if your sukkah looked like this. Okay? You can't say love it at both ends. Mm -hmm. Okay? But you put it up here and you say love it up here, then you have, so if it's seven, right? If it's seven and a half and you're saying love it, then you got ten tfachim, and then, but that's But then you have to extend it down. And that would only follow with Rebiosi. So according to the bright that says seven and a bit, that's, that's assuming it's a big sukkah. If you put it down here, everybody, by the way, would agree that it's good. And there's one gear that Rashi says has of the Gemara like that, that it's not about Rebiosi. If you put it down here, you said Lovewood, and then it extends all the way up. You used Lovewood plus Dofen Akuma, Do, uh, Good Asik. You see that? Right? You see, you see that? You use Lovewood to give you 10, and once you have a wall, then you say Good Asik. Okay, so that's the easier case. But our gear of the Gemara says maybe we're even talking about a bigger Kiddush. That you put it up here, you said lavud, and then you said good ochis, and but that is only Rabbi Yossi would say that because that is the idea of a mechitza suspended off of the ground. Okay, so that would be the chiddush of the rights uh, of seven and a bit. Let's just finish to the end of the daf. Um, okay, I'm um, Rabbi Yossi. Pas arba arba. Now a machatzelus a math means something that is running sort of widthwise. And they were doing it, you know, off of the off of the schach and off of the ground. He talks about a pas, which also talks about a plank of wood, but somehow that signifies something that's going vertically. Okay, so you have a vertical plank of wood that's four tefachim umashu in a bit. Matir besuka mishum dofen that works because what is the minimum, you know, size of each, of each uh, length and width of a sukkah? What's a sukkah? Do people paying attention? Seven, seven, seven by seven, seven tefachim. So if you have basically a sukkah that is right a seven tefach wall, and what you went ahead and did is you put a mat here. I'm not good at this. Anyway, you had whatever. Anyway, you put a mat that's four and a half, and it's within. Oh, that's why we have to do. Let's go. Ah! You have one wall here, okay? And you have, let's say, a little bit of another wall. You have your one in a mashahu. 
And where is going? And but now what you did for your for your critical second wall is you put a something four and a half year four and a half. I'm just calling it a half. Well, if it's within three tefachim, two point nine, you can say lavur, attach it. The total is more than seven or seven. And now you've got your two walls and a mashahu, okay? And therefore, it's good. So, matir besukah mishum dofen. Umukim lo b'pachos mishlosha tfachim samach l'dofen. You put it within three tfachim of the wall. B'kol pachos mishlosha tfachim k'lavadami, l'dofen k'lavadami, and then it works by lavad. It says, my kamash mulan, so what's the chiddish? Ha kamash mulan, the chiddish is, k'shir meshech sukah k'tana shiva, that the minimum size of a sukkah is seven tfachim. Okay, it's a funny way of teaching me the minimum size of a sukkah is seven tfachim, but that's the basic chiddish that is embedded in that halacha. All right. I know. Yeah, I don't know. I, I really don't. <laughs>